today. Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to look in verses 1 through 11. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the highest mountain, O Jerusalem, that thou that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, he shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Now the prophet Isaiah, by and large, he is uh, prophesying to the nation of Judah. Remember, Israel went through a civil war at that time. And so Judah was the uh, southern kingdom. And Isaiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom because they were guilty of idolatry. They were guilty of turning against the Lord as well. And even though they were going through a revival under King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah had, uh, he had, T torn down the high places, torn down the places of false worship of idolatry. He had gotten all of the idols. They actually had idols that were in the temple. He'd gotten rid of all of those. And so the nation was actually undergoing a spiritual revival as well as a uh, national revival. Their military was getting stronger. The economy was getting stronger. Good times were coming along. But despite all that, there were still dark days ahead for the nation of Judah. Their captivity was still coming, and that was prophesied at the end of Isaiah chapter 39. But even in light of the prophecy of the coming captivity into Babylon, the Lord had Isaiah comfort the people. He wanted Isaiah to comfort the people. He offered Judah hope going into those dark times to remind them that there was a purpose for all this, and he would bring them out on the other side. God offers us hope even though we face dark times. God offers us hope even though the future doesn't look so bright. He offers us hope. He reminds us that there is a purpose for dark times, for hard times. He reminds us that there is light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. And he charges us to stay busy with his work regardless of what season we're in, regardless of whether there are good times or regardless of whether there are hard times. And by and large, in the future, we may see a national revival. We may, see the, we may see America turn back toward the Lord. We may see a time when our nation is prosperous, when we don't think about recessions and gas prices and, and, and that sort of thing. We may actually see a time when we are not watching politicians tear themselves and half of the nation apart in their, in their political discourse. We may see good days ahead, but... Going into the, the days leading into the return of Christ are going to be dark times. And those dark times, they have a purpose too. And there's a purpose for those. There's light at the end of those. And God charges us to stay busy even if we are heading into those dark times leading up to the return of Christ. There is a purpose for hard times. God had a will for Israel and he had a will for Judah. And basically what God wanted for the nation of Israel, he wanted to be their God. If you were to boil it all down, there are a lot of verses that talk about God's relationship with Israel, but he wanted to be their God. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, the Lord said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee 
and to thy seed after thee. So he was making a, a covenant with Abraham that would be extended onto his descendants, which would be the nation of Israel. And it was to be an everlasting covenant. A covenant is an agreement. And God's covenant, his agreement, basically entails what all he's going to do for us. There, there's just not a whole lot we can do for God. So God's covenant with us is what all he can do for us, what all he will do for us. The book of Isaiah starts out in verse 18, says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's what God wanted to, wants to reason with us about is our sin. And though they're scarlet, though they're stains, he will cleanse us of our sins. That's God's covenant to us. If you, if you get down to the very root of what God's covenant is, it's about cleansing us from our sin and receiving us into his kingdom. And so God wanted to be a God to Israel. He wanted to be their God, to answer their prayers, to protect and provide for them, and to receive their worship. That's what he wanted concerning Israel, and he has included us in that desire. He wants to be our God. He wants to hear and answer our prayers. He wants to provide for and protect us, and he wants to receive our worship. He wants us to worship him. He wants us to pray to him. He wants to provide for us. He wants to provide our needs for us. He wants to protect us. That's God's desire, is to be God. That's what God wants to do. He wanted to be their God. He also wanted to be their king. In Psalm 47, verses 2 through 4, the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. <clears throat> he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. Selah. Psalm 47 speaks to the fact that God is a king, and he is king over all the earth, but there's a special relationship if you read Psalm 47 between him and Jacob or him and Israel. Uh, those two are just about inter interchangeable when you read scripture. There's a special relationship between him and Israel. He, he chose an inheritance for Israel, and he would subdue the nations that would come up and fight against Israel. Now the Bible teaches, if you read the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, the Bible teaches if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've been included in that promise with Israel. See, if you know Jesus as your personal Savior, you're a spiritual Jew. You're a spiritual Israelite. So when we talk about promises to Israel, the promise is also to you if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And so he wanted to be a king. He wanted to be, he wanted to be their God. He wanted to be their king. What does a king do? A king goes out and he conquers. He conquers for his nation. He conquers other nations to protect his nation and to provide for his nation's interest. He one day will conquer Israel's enemies and he will conquer our enemies. And when I'm talking about conquering our enemies, I'm not talking about the co-worker that gets under your skin because he's just an annoying person. I'm talking about the people who want to destroy you, the people who want to destroy your faith, and the people who want to silence Christianity. Those are the enemies. Those, those, are, those are God's enemies. And so he will conquer his enemies and one day he will return to this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ will return to this earth and there will be our inheritance and our inheritance will be in his kingdom. His reward will be with him. Why? Because he loves us. He wanted to be Israel's king. He wants to be your king. He wanted to be Israel's God. He wants to be your God. And that is his will. That is his desire. He wants to dwell with us. If you read in the scriptures about when, when God instructed the building of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, he said, there will I meet with my people. And the tabernacle was in the middle of the camp of those Israelites when they were out in that wilderness. You, these two tribes were camped out on that side of the tabernacle, these three on that side, three, these three on that side. What am I up to now? Eight tribes. They, they, were, they were surrounding the tabernacle, and each tribe had his assigned space. On, on, the, uh, on the sides of the tabernacle. Please don't ask me which side, which tribe slept on. I didn't memorize all that. But there, there, were, there were the tribes that were camped out. Why? Because God is dwelling in the midst, in the middle of his people. He wants to dwell with his people. And in, in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 6, we're upgrading God's house from being a tabernacle or a tent to actually being a temple. We're actually going to build a structure for him in 1 Kings chapter 6. And in 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, God told King Solomon, who was, who was the king who was having the, temp, the temple built for the Lord, he said, Concerning this house which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, 
which I spake unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the people of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. God wanted to lead and to dwell among his people. The problem with that is the people were continually in rebellion against God. And so God could not dwell among a people who despised him, who hated him, who turned against him, who didn't think that he was good enough for him. And so the dark days had to come. The captivity had to come to basically straighten out his people so that they, on the other side of that captivity, when he brought them back into the land, they would have faith in him and they would trust him as their God. He had to let them see what life would be like without him. That he had to let them see what would happen to them if he wasn't their protector or their provider. That was the purpose for Israel's dark times. So in verse 2, and back in Isaiah chapter 40, in verse 2, the Lord says, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So the reason these dark times are coming is because of the sin of the nation, the sin of the people. But the dark times, the captivity that was coming would accomplish its purpose and it would eventually lead to the re reunification of the reconciliation between God and his people. Now, we haven't seen the fulfillment of that yet. That is going to come at the end of the seven-year tribulation when Christ returns and establishes his kingdom. But you can say one thing about Israel and Judah being in captivity in Babylon. After they came back from the captivity, they, they did not participate in idolatry ever again after that. God is aiming to restore Israel as his kingdom. There are dark times... In our lives. And God uses those to teach us to depend on him. God uses hard things in our lives, hard times in our lives to teach us to pray to him. He allows things to come into our life that are totally 100% beyond our control. And he, he brings those into our life to teach us to lean on him, to depend on him, to pray to him, and to get used to trusting him to carry us through those situations. On a national scale or a worldwide scale, there are dark times in the future. The uh, seven-year tribulation and the times that will lead up to the seven-year tribulation. The point of those years is to bring the nation of Israel to repentance where they'll accept Jesus as their Savior. But it's also to put an end to sin on this earth and to usher in the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to set up his kingdom. And so there are hard times ahead of us. Now, every preacher who has preached since Jesus ascended to be at the right hand of the Father preached that those dark times are upon us and they're going to happen within the next few years. And I feel the same way. I feel that this, these times are very close to us. But I also know a lot of preachers over the last 2,000 years have been wrong in thinking that it was going to happen within the next few days. The Bible says in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, whereby some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish. And so why hasn't Jesus come back yet? He's giving plenty of time for everyone to hear the gospel and those who will receive the gospel to receive the gospel. He is being patient. He is being long suffering. He is giving us time. He is giving people time to get right with him. And the Bible says, same, uh, same passage in Second Peter says, you know, a day, a, a day, for the Lord is as a thousand years for us. So he's not operating by our timetable anyway. So we look out and we see prophecies being fulfilled and we think this thing is going to start within the next couple of years and the next couple of years come and it doesn't happen. Well, what happened? We're operating by God's timetable and we don't know when that is, but I'm telling you, I'm, I, I can tell you this with all certainty, it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen in my lifetime. I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. But it's, whether it happens in my lifetime or not, it's still going to happen. And we're going to see the Lord return to this earth. And it's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be a glorious time. Brother Stephen mentioned this morning about there are some days that you're praying like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, even so come Lord Jesus. And there are other days that you'd rather kind of hang around and see what your grandchildren turn out like. And believe it or not, I've actually thought that. I've actually thought about grandchildren. Now, I know I'm kind of young to be thinking that way, but watching my kids grow up and watching what great kids are turning into kind of makes me wonder what their kids will turn out like. And I, just, I can't help it. That's just who I am. But I'm telling you that 
when the Lord returns and we are received into his kingdom, we're not going to be worried about the temporary things of this life. We're not going to be worried about, you know, what we did as far as getting our promotions at work or as, par or as far as building something or as far as buying something or obtaining something. What, what's going to be important to us at that point is our relationship with our Lord. But the comfort that we have, whatever we face, whoever gets elected in November, whatever the economy does next year, whatever happens, we know that one day the Lord is going to return, and that is going to be a blessed day. And that brings us to our second point. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We start off in chapter 40 here in the book of Isaiah. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. God wanted Isaiah to comfort the people. They needed the comfort, and they needed the hope going into the captivity so that they would be looking forward to their restoration to their land, to their return to the land, and for the restoration of their kingdom. And they needed to be looking forward to the return to the coming of the Lord. It wasn't the return because Jesus hadn't come the first time yet at this point. But they needed to be looking forward to the coming of the Lord. They needed that hope. Their iniquity was pardoned. Their warfare accomplished. God was saying that forgiveness of sin is there. Warfare is accomplished. These days that you are looking at, one day they will come to an end. And there will be good times on the other side of that. God wants us to be comforted knowing that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And he wants us to be comforted by the promise of better days. When are some of the most heartbreak when are some of the most heartbreaking times that you have ever endured? Heartbreaking times. The times when you are burying a loved one. When you, you go to the funeral and then there's the graveside and you know, you're saying goodbye. And you sometimes I've seen people break down and cry. I've seen people hold it in. I've seen people handle it like champs and fall apart a month later. Uh, sometimes several months later. Those heartbreaking times, losing a loved one. And whenever you go to a funeral service, many times you'll hear a preacher or somebody read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And a lot of times they quit reading right there. But that's comforting, isn't it? To know one day he's going to descend, he's going to catch us up, we're going to meet him in the air, and what's going to happen? First uh, Thessalonians four sixteen through 18. What's going to happen? We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. With whom? Those who are asleep. Those who have passed on before us. Those loved ones that we've lost. People, there are preachers that are preaching a message that say we won't know each other in heaven because we'll be all spiritual and, and you won't know your wife and you won't know your grandparents. We're all just going to be like angels. No, that, I don't read that in the scripture. And I believe that's Satan's message trying to steal the joy of heaven from us. The Bible says we're going to be caught up together and meet them, be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so there's two great things going to happen. We're going to be reunited with our family and friends and loved ones, and that's going to be a glad reunion morning. Isn't that a, isn't that a, a song? And then, and then we're going to meet the Lord face to face, and our faith will be sight. But what a lot of people neglect to do is they neglect to read verse 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. God wants you to have that comfort. When you are singing Amazing Grace at the graveside, God wants you to have the comfort that you will see your loved one again in the air. When, when we meet together in the kingdom, if they knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, you will want, and you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, one day you will be reunited with that loved one. Our comfort comes from knowing one day we will meet the Lord in the air. You know, we get made fun of a lot for being Christians. Uh, we're we're simple-minded, aren't we? We uh, we are superstitious. We believe in a in an archaic book. We're legalistic and judgmental, and we never have fun. If you if you listen to the people who make fun of us talk, that's the way they think of us. And I have a blast. I mean, I have I have good times. 
you know, having a having another preacher in the household has given me the excuse to watch football all weekend, and that doesn't normally happen, and I've had a lot of joy. I've got to watch the Texas Longhorns win, and I got to watch the Houston Texans win, and I'm not sure what the Cowboys – no, the Cowboys play tomorrow night, so that doesn't even matter. So, you know, I've got to watch a lot of football this weekend. I've had a lot of fun. I've had joy this weekend. I've got I've got a lot of fellowship in with a with a brother in Christ, and that has been uh, that has been a joy. I got to uh, I got to go out and move brush and do manual labor and feel like a man. Now that's 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 good times, you know. But the comfort. But where am I? People making fun of me because I don't have fun. I do have fun, and you have fun. We have joy in our lives, okay? But the true joy comes in knowing that one day. Because we believe that one day Christ is going to come back. And the joy is in knowing that we will see him. He's not going to come back secretly and live in a building in New York City or be out in the desert somewhere. He's going to come back. Everybody's going to see it. We're going to see it. We're going to be caught up in the air with him. And what we have believed all these years will be tangible. We will see him. Thomas you know, he missed, he missed a church service, and Jesus showed up after he had been crucified and rose again from the grave, and Jesus showed up, and Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas showed up after Jesus was gone. They said, you missed it. Jesus was here, and Thomas just couldn't believe it. So Jesus showed up and showed himself to Thomas. And, and what did Thomas say? He said, my Lord and my God. Just seeing Jesus resurrected, I mean, it, it impacted him. We're going to see him in the flesh, face to face. And that's, that's our comfort and being reunited with our loved ones and entering into his kingdom. Imagine we have been, mankind has been trying to establish a perfect government on this earth since the, since the beginning and we've never done it. We've, we've had kings, we've had presidents, we've had elected governments, we've had totalitarian governments. We, mankind has tried capitalism, mankind has tried communism, there's something wrong with all of them. <clears throat> We're going to enter into a kingdom with a perfect government because our king is going to be a perfect king. So we should comfort each other with those words. People say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. My experience in the short eight years that I've been in ministry, my experience has been the most heavenly minded usually are the most earthly good because they have an eternal perspective on things. We should be comforted knowing that one day we'll see our Lord face to face in the future. Verse 5 says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this is not just something we're going to keep amongst ourselves, and it's not going to be something hidden. Everyone is going to see the Lord when he returns. It is going to be a very public event. It's going to be so public that the Bible teaches that there are going to be anti-Christian, anti-God armies that are actually going to come up and do war against him. So it's, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, CNN gave live coverage of that event. It's going to be a very public event, but we're going to be by his side, and he's going to be protecting us. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. He will be revealed for who he is. But the thing that you get the comfort from in Isaiah 40, verse 5, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The Lord said it, so you can take it to the bank. God can't lie. Y'all ever watched Dukes of Hazard years ago? Yeah, Uncle Jesse. You know, Uncle Jesse was, you know, a trustworthy man. Everybody trusted him. Good man. I mean, he ran moonshine for a living, but other than that, he was a good man. An old episode of that came on TV the other night, and the boys were watching it with me, and they couldn't figure out how the good guys were the guys running from the police. They, they were trying to... Times have changed, right? But anyway, Uncle Jesse, in one of the, uh, in one of the uh, episodes, he said something, and everybody believed it because Uncle Jesse said it, because Uncle Jesse's trustworthy, because Uncle Jesse doesn't lie. God cannot lie. And so, therefore, if God says it, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. One day, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. One day, we're going to be caught up together with him in the air. We're going to be reunited with our loved ones. The, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And God's word, by the way, is eternal. Have y'all ever read the Canterbury Tales? Beowulf? 
Paradise Lost. I mean, these are these are some of these are ancient works of English literature from a, I don't know five, six, seven, eight. No, probably closer to a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago. Now, if you went to college, you've read. You you know, an English teacher made you read these things if you went to college. But if you didn't go to college, chances are you've never. What is, what is Brother Leland talking about? Who is Geoffrey Chaucer? You know. Um, they're still around, but they're around in small doses just because there's a handful of English lit teachers in the country that are making kids read this, and the kids can't even read it. The kids don't read it. I'll tell you what I did in college. I went and bought Cliff Notes, and I told her what the Cliff Notes said happened because the English language from a 1,000 years ago is completely different than the English language now. We're not talking King James, these, thou's, and thou shalt. We're talking different words and different spellings, and so it was very weird. But the Bible was written thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago. The, the, the book of Revelation was completed somewhere, I believe, around the year 90. Okay, so we're looking at almost 2,000 years ago. And you've got people reading it. It's being it's in widespread publication, much wider spread than the Canterbury Tales or Beowulf or any of these other earthly ancient artifact um, documents. Why is that? Why do we have the Bible in such widespread publication, all kinds of different languages, all kinds of different countries being spread throughout the world? It's not just a handful of Christian fundamentalists that are doing this. It is happening. Why? Because God's word is eternal. And the Bible says in the latter days the gospel will be preached throughout all the world. And we're seeing that fulfilled right now. We've got a mission report on the back wall there from a man who is ministering to uh, a place called Turkana in Kenya. Now, I knew Kenya existed, never heard of Turkana. And I'm, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but it's just another place you've never heard of. We've got a missionary there. And so that's another prophecy that's being fulfilled. But the Bible is eternal, and that's why it has been around since it was written. Since the, uh, from the oldest book is roughly, I would say, about 1,500, you know, uh, older than that, I mean, we're, look, we're talking about thousands of years that the Bible has been around, and it is still around, and it is becoming read more and more widespread. Why? Because the word of our God shall stand forever in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. Verse 8 says, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Everything you look around you here is temporary. It's all going to go away. This building is very temporary. I expect the back wall to fall off any day now. No, you're, you're completely safe, don't worry. But e even the new building that we built is going to be a temporary structure. Now, the, the architect will tell you it's a permanent structure, but it's not going to be here forever. So therefore, it's temporary. The, it's, it's, the law enforcement center is a mighty nice facility, very well built, very solid. It's a temporary facility. The money in the bank is very temporary, and if you've ever paid bills, you know just how temporary money in the bank is. It's, it's temporary, and everything that we have right now that we are looking at is temporary except for the word of the Lord. So God said it, you can take it to the bank, and God's word will never be done away with because it's eternal. It will endure forever. You cannot amend it. You cannot repeal it. It's there. Verse 10 says, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. The Lord will come with a strong hand and he will rule. That means he's going to set things right and he's going to institute peace. And when he comes back, he's going to bring his reward with him. The book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. When he returns to this earth, we're, he's going to reward us, those who know him as Savior. We will receive our eternal rewards at that time. And he will gather us, and he will care for us like a flock of sheep. Have you ever seen a shepherd care for sheep? And back in those days, the shepherd went so far as to live with the sheep. Today, we turn them out to pasture for a while. But those, uh, those shepherds back then, they, they lived out in the pasture with the sheep. They cared for those sheep. They fed them by hand. They loved them. They took good care of them. And that's how God's going to take care of us, how the Lord is going to take care of us, how Jesus is going to take care of us. He's going to gather us together, but he's going to take care of us. There, whatever we are facing in the days ahead, whether it's personal problems, national problems, whatever the problems are, there is light at the end of the tunnel. 
And so seeing that there's light at the end of the tunnel, we should have hope and we should keep up his work until he returns, regardless of what season of life we're going through. In verse 3, the Bible says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now this is a foreshadowing of John the Baptist. But what did John the Baptist do? He prepared the people for the coming of the Lord. He prepared the people to meet Jesus. And that's what our business is. We are preparing people for the second coming of the Lord. In verse 6, the voice said, cry. That word cry means to call out. It means to proclaim. What are we to proclaim? We are to proclaim the word of the Lord. We need to be busy spreading the gospel, and we need to be busy warning people of the coming judgment. There is a consequence for not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and it is not just that you don't get to go to heaven. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you'll be condemned to hell. And hell is a place of everlasting torment. It's a place of everlasting judgment. It's a place where God, for eternity, pours out his wrath on those who, uh, who fought against him, who rebelled against him. We need to be busy warning people that that consequence exists. Because as long as it's go to heaven or don't go to heaven, you know, I mean... Sometimes the kids at school have recess, and sometimes the kid doesn't want to go to recess. He wants to sit under the shade tree and read a book. You know, so he didn't really miss anything about not going to recess. Let me tell you, there's, it's an either-or scenario. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. And the only way to get into heaven is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then if we look in uh, verse 9, it says, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. The Bible told Zion, told Jerusalem to get up into the high mountain, get to a place where your voice can carry, where you can get the word out. Lift up your voice with strength. You're speaking, if you are speaking the gospel, if you are speaking God's word, you are speaking for, for the Lord. You are speaking his message. You can, you can share that with confidence. And share Jesus with others. And so we may be looking at dark days ahead as a nation. Personally, you may be looking at dark days ahead as an individual. Worldwide, the dark days are coming. We just don't know when, but we know they're on the way. If you read the book of Revelation, that is not a party, at least not till you get to the 22nd chapter, and only then if you're on the right side. So we know that dark days are coming. What's our comfort? What's our hope? Our hope is knowing that God is still God, and he is still working things out, and this is all according to his purpose. Our comfort is knowing that if we know Jesus as our Savior, one day those hard times will be over and we will enter into his kingdom. So in the meantime, we need to be busy doing what God has called us to do. In Isaiah chapter 39, the prophet Isaiah prophesied to King Hezekiah, and we've been studying King Hezekiah for a couple of weeks, and he's, he, you know, he was a good king. He made a couple of stupid mistakes, but other than that, he was a good king. And Isaiah told King Hezekiah that his, his descendants will be taken into captivity where they will become eunuchs in the king of Babylon's palace. And King Hezekiah, he says in, in Isaiah 39, verse 8, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. So he understands God's word and he understands that God does all things for the benefit of his people. And then he says something profound here. He said, Moreover, there shall be peace and truth in my days. And when I first read that, I thought, how selfish, you know. His children are going to be taken into captivity, but he's all right with it because it's not going to happen during his lifetime. <clears throat> you ever talk to somebody, yeah, Social Security is going to go broke, but it's going to be, go broke after I die. Uh, so thanks, that doesn't help me much. Um, that's not what King Hezekiah was saying. King Hezekiah was saying, there shall be peace and truth in my days. Who was King Hezekiah? He was a king that led his country through a spiritual revival. The captivity is coming. The captivity is coming as a result of sin. Dark days are ahead, but whatever is going on in my days, there will be peace and truth. What King Hezekiah was saying is, while I am still king, things are still going to be done the right way. There will be peace. There will be truth. I will stand for truth. Whatever is happening in the world, whoever gets elected in November, and I'll be so glad, and we don't have to talk about who's getting elected in November, Whoever gets elected in November, 
whatever law gets passed, whatever the economy does, you can make the decision and make the commitment that there will be peace and truth in your days, meaning there will be peace and truth in your household, in your family. In your life, you will stand on truth, you will stand on God's word, you will follow God's word, and you will lead your family to do the same thing. And so the world outside may be burning down, but inside your family, inside your home, inside your household, you can still have things together according to God's plan. And as you do that, and you look down what's coming down the road, and it may not look pleasant, but let me tell you, there's a light at the end of that tunnel, and you can trust God to carry you through that tunnel. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the blessings that you've given us, for your word and for your comfort and for the hope that you've given us through your word, Father. We pray that you would comfort each heart here and that you would guide us in the direction that you'd have us to go and that you would teach us how to have peace and truth in our days. Father, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.